This video covers the second half of our accommodations on England's Coast to Coast Path. On day 6, we walked from Kirby Stephen to Kelp. This day featured rolling hills that passed the mysterious Nine Standards and through some of the well-known bogs of the Yorkshire Dales National Park. My mom couldn't find an inn that lit her fire in Kelp, so she selected the Frith Lodge outside of town for this night. Well, we know it's the turnoff. We just hope we don't have another long way to walk. As we've already walked about point eight since we got off the trails. This spot is actually located on the Pennian Way and is about 1.5 miles off the coast to coast path. It's the only place that we chose that wasn't on the trail and we were really second guessing the decision to stay there when we were walking that extra distance up a steep hill. However, from the minute we got there, we knew that it was worth it, as this was our favorite place we stayed along our entire journey. From being greeted at the gate by a friendly dog with a cold drink, to the welcoming hosts in comfy rooms, this place was wonderful. The hosts are avid walkers who have walked the coast to coast and the Pennine Way, and they gave us lots of good advice on how to manage the hike for the next few days. That evening, we had a communal dinner with the other lodgers. The food was fantastic, and getting to know the other hikers was the highlight of our stay. We would absolutely, positively stay here again. Day 7 started with a special crumpet breakfast at the Frith Lodge, and then we followed the Penine Way back to the coast to coast. The path was an easy, undulating one, along a river with expansive views of green pastures. The first town we came to was Mooker, which has pubs, shops, and a tea room. It's about a half mile off the trail, but we thought it was worth it, and we stopped for tea and some cakes. I recommend going back to the trail the way you came because the shortcut we tried didn't work well for us. I ended up with wet feet, and the shortcut was along a busy road, and we really didn't save much time. After Mooker, we continued through pastures with frequent gates to the town of Gunnerside. There's a busy pub here, and it looked good, but we weren't that hungry, so we grabbed some quick sandwiches and kept moving. This did seem like a nice town though. We finished our walk through some pastures and along a sparsely traveled smooth road into Reeth, which was another nice town. In Reeth, we stay at the King's Arms Hotel. This was one of the best preserved places we stayed. Unfortunately, that preservation takes a lot of work and the front of the hotel was covered with scaffolding while we were there. It didn't disturb the ambiance inside. This was one of those old character hotels with winding halls, but the room was very nice with the classic old town view. We met up with our new friends from the Frith Lodge for dinner, and Greg helped me with my blisters that were still a problem. We loved the King's Arms, but there were several similar inns on the Wreath Main Square. Some friends stayed at the Black Bull and said it was also good. No matter which hotel you stay in, we recommend staying on the main square in Wreath. This was one of the most special places that we stayed during the entire coast to coast. After a delicious breakfast at the King's Arms, we headed out for day eight, which was a relatively easy 11 mile walk through the rolling hills into Richmond. There wasn't anywhere to stop for a break, but you probably won't need it if you start with a good breakfast. The walk both into and out of Richmond was nice, but we stayed the night in town for cultural interest reasons. Richmond is a historic town, and it's the largest on the coast to coast, with a population of about 8,500. This old market town has a castle, a nice main square, an abbey, and a military museum. We stayed at the Black Lion Hotel, which was historic and very nice, but there are many suitable hotels in Richmond. We particularly loved the comfortable and classic decor of the bar downstairs. 
In fact, we loved it so much that we ended up remodeling my office at home to look like it. To give you an idea of what these old hotels are like, here's an example. This is the lobby of our hotel. Super cool. All right, now we're gonna give a tour, Molly, you can go first, of what it takes to get to our room in the Black Lion. It's not your standard room. Pants hanging from everywhere. And finally our room. Which is decorated with, of course. That are dry. We met up with a bunch of coast to coast hikers for a really nice Italian dinner that night and got a great night of sleep at the Black Lion. On day nine, Molly and I took a recovery day. My feet were still killing me and she was getting sick. So Pablo walked the 14 miles to Danby Whisk with Greg, a friend we'd met at the Frisk Lodge. Danby Whisk is a small town with only one country inn, but it does have a couple of bed and breakfasts. We chose the inn, the White Swan, and we're not sure if we would choose it again. In all of our other properties, we were welcomed at least to the bar when we arrived, but the White Swan didn't open till four, so we had a pretty long wait in the heat outside to get in. At that point, there was a line of hikers to check in, and the process was really slow. And the bar wasn't open to get a cool drink. This would have all probably been fine, but there isn't anywhere else in town that's open for a bite and a drink, so it really stood out. The staff also seemed overwhelmed at dinner, and breakfast had a definite prefab feel to it. Our room was fine and dinner was good, so the White Swan is a decent option, we just didn't love it. On day 10, Pablo walked with more friends made along the way as he trekked the 12 miles to us motherly. Ideally, one would hike a little further this day to shorten the following one, but it was worth having the uneven A's to get to stay in the charming town of us motherly. This is a cool, hiker-friendly town with a comfy tea shop, good services, and a few good inns. We stayed at the Golden Lion, which is right in the center of the village. This is one of the hotels that we had to book by phone, which always makes me a little nervous, but they were expecting us and the rooms were very nice. This hotel has a good bar, a good restaurant, and great character. We would definitely stay here again. After a long hike 
It is hard to oversell the joy of a great dinner with unlimited water and a cold pint, especially while sitting in a comfy chair. This place delivered on all fronts. Day 11 was our last recovery day, but Pablo forged on and walked the 20 undulating miles from Osmotherly to Blakey Ridge. Today he got an early start and walked alone, and that made this stage seem pretty long. He was able to break up his walk with a visit to Lordstone's Cafe, another classic stop on the coast to coast. If you're camping, you could break this long day into two by staying here. After getting fueled, he kept going and arrived in the late afternoon at the Lion Inn. This large country hotel is the definition of getting away from it all. It's in the middle of fields filled with sheep, some of which were there to greet us when we arrived. There is nowhere else to stay anywhere near this spot. But you don't need anywhere else. Just call well ahead and reserve your room at this classic hiking hotel in our third national park, the North York Moors National Park. The rooms at the Lion Inn were pretty average with small bathrooms and the food was very abundant. This wasn't the nicest place we stayed, but we would fly all the way back to England and hike here again to stay in this place. It is that cool. Day 12 was an easy day of walking, just about 13 miles to Grosmont. This was a wide open day, so bring your sunscreen. After our full English at the Lion Inn, we walked to Egdon Bridge to meet up with friends. There are three choices of where to stop this night. Blaisdell is at about 9 miles, Egdon Bridge is about 11 miles in, and Grosmont is at 13 miles. We stopped at the Arncliffe Arms in Blaisdell for lunch, and if you want to stop here for the night, this is probably a good choice. This is my first, the first cheese and pickle sandwich I've ever had. We stayed in Egdon Bridge because my mom really liked the look of the hotel, but from a logistics perspective, I would advise staying in Grosmont. The next day is a long one, and it is more tiring hiking, so I feel like it is better to knock out some of the miles on day 12. That being said, we loved the place that we stayed, the Horseshoe Hotel. It had a nice food truck area in the yard, a good restaurant, and wonderful rooms with cute little snacks. Our favorite part was the picnic area outside, with music, a festive atmosphere, and Mr. Whippy, or soft serve ice cream. We made an early start on day 13, our final day, because we didn't have lodging in Robin Hood's Bay. In spite of calling 10 months ahead, everything here was already booked because of a musical festival taking place the weekend we arrived. For better luck, try to avoid arriving on a weekend. In general, day 13 was a harder navigational day and it's fairly long but the last three miles along the coast are spectacular. It was an ending that was definitely worthy of this great trek. The coast of coast officially ends at the water by the Bay Hotel. We had drinks and a snack there, and we would definitely try to stay there next time. However, there looked like there was plenty of lodging in Robin Hood's Bay. We hope these two videos will assist you in planning your coast to coast trek and can help take a little stress out of the experience. We really love this trek and highly recommend it, although we do acknowledge that we had unusually good weather luck and that it's a pretty difficult trail. Please let us know of other treks that you'd like to see us walk and share with you in the future. Thanks for watching, please like and subscribe.